climate change is not separate from the way we produce and use materials. It's very much connected, embodied energy and um, energy just used to you know, transport goods and, and, and all of that. So there's the energy solution, but there's also the material solution to climate change. And so all of these are connected and that's why uh, we want to make sure that companies do in the future report on their circular economic performance to, to show how they're acting to, to um, have these positive impacts. Yarko Havas is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Yarko leads the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's insight and analysis work. INA consists of the data and metrics initiative with a focus on measuring company level circular economy performance, circuletics, and teams working on upcoming focus topics for the foundation, as well as the case study program. So really the stories, the wonderful stories that come from using these tools, the Circuletics 2.0 tool. Prior to joining the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, Yarko was an engagement manager at McKinsey and Company, based first in Tokyo, then in Brussels. His consulting work focused on agriculture and chemicals industry in both private and public sectors. Yarko's academic background is in environmental engineering and sustainability sciences. Yarko, welcome to the podcast. It's so great to have you here. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for the introduction. You're, you're most welcome. I'm glad you gave me the short version because you've been doing this a while and I'm sure I could go on and on. It's really about the environment. It's really about science and sustainability and, and how we can use the tools to get there. We've experienced a crazy time uh, this last 12 plus months of what we're experiencing in the world, not only um, the pandemic and inauguration, Black Lives Matters and, and uh, Asian racism, and I could go on and on, but your discussions, your topics, the things you're focusing on, and especially with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, is kind of thinking of bigger, higher level economic models, models for life, for business, for work, on how we can actually not only live within the planetary boundaries of our planet, kind of this circular view of life, this closed system, very resilient models, but how have you seen you've weathered this time with that pre-work, that pre, has it proven to be a better business model, a better life operating model? And what kind of stories or things can you tell us that you've seen during this crazy time? Yes, it's, uh, it's indeed crazy times and, uh, and, um, of course, the whole, whole COVID crisis, especially the latest one, and I guess that impacts us all, has been devastating for the most of it. But it's also made, I guess, circular economy, uh, for one, more relevant than it's, than it's ever been. Um, and, um, and, and we've really seen that in you know, value chain, supply chain disruptions, um, even, even just the ship that went sideways in Suez Canal just shows how fragile these very efficient uh, supply chains are and in circular economy where things are more localized in many instances can be also a way to address that. And I guess, especially in Europe, uh, also policymakers have seen that and, and the recovery plans from COVID um, have taken circular economy as a key sort of uh, component um, and the whole uh, green deal in, in Europe has already uh, also accelerated because of this crisis and and now there's a chance to in a way reset and um, and and do things better and address climate change uh, address our very linear way of, of taking stuff out of the ground making products out of it and then dumping it and and doing that in a different way and, and that's really what circular economy is all about Thank you for that introduction. I want to go even deeper because there are some people on, on my show or listeners that really have heard the buzzword sustainability, resilience, you know, the, the new green deal, 
cradle to cradle circular economy. You know, um, they've heard about donut economics. They've heard about mission economics. They've heard about all, you know, all, all these things emerging uh, lately, a lot around regenerative, res restorative, regenerative economies, regenerative capitalism. Um, can you maybe tingle and touch a little bit on more the description of how should we understand circular economy? Is it a new economic model? Uh, what's the basics of it? How can just any lay person kind of understand the thought process and philosophy, how it came about? And then also now after this pandemic, how is that being applied? How do we see companies, organizations, cities starting to, to move in that direction once they understand what it's all about? Yeah, um, there is indeed a lot of the, the sort of concepts and movements that you mentioned are have inspired circular economy. Uh, circular economy has in turn inspired some others, but in the end, you know, it's, it's a very simple concept. We have one planet, that planet has finite amount of, of materials, so you can't use things up and dump them. You need to keep on using the same molecules that we have, um, we you know on this planet, and and that's in the simplest form, and I think the most important form of circular economy. That's what it is about. The economy needs to be built in a way where materials are used, and then they're reused, and they're reused again as many times as you can until you can't reuse something again, and, and then you recycle. Uh, the components or, or the atoms, let's say, at the end in, in a recycling process and nothing gets wasted. Because in the end, if something gets wasted, we will eventually run out of stuff to use in our economies. And, and that's really the, the, the thinking behind it. And Ellen, who founded our foundation, who was a professional uh, yachtswoman uh, in, in her earlier career, came to this realization on her sailing boat. She has finite amount of food, finite amount of material to fix her boat while sailing around the world uh, nonstop. And, and towards the end of her, her record-breaking um, uh, effort to, to sail around the world single-handed as fast as possible, she came to the realization that it's no different. We are in a boat floating through space, really, and, and we have finite materials. And that's where our foundation started and, and started to look at this, um, really. 10 years ago and and um, and today as i said it's more relevant than ever and and i think you you asked also like what where it has it manifested itself uh to date and i think in many places i mean more and more universities are are teaching specifically and researching specifically on circular economy and how that can help us create a better future um policymakers to the highest levels are looking into this and i think also now in North America with the new administration, it's, it's back on the table. In EU, it's very much front and center on the EU level policymaker agenda and, and then in countries specifically within EU. And then elsewhere, for example, Chile, China has its own version of it. So it is, it is becoming mainstream, let's say, and, and large companies also. So some of the biggest brands in the world recognize that they kind of need to get going with this. Um, if for nothing else than for public perception, because they can't keep wasting stuff and, and finding uh, their packaging material in the, in the oceans and, and um, circular economy is really um, upstream solutions to, to tackle that. Not gather the bottle from the ocean, but design bottles for the right types of systems upfront so that we, we eliminate waste before it happens. And, and that's one of the kind of principles of uh, how we want to keep materials in use. There, there's some great wisdoms out there around this thought process that, that you mentioned. So kind of old, the original term, you know, Spaceship Earth was Kenneth Boulding, uh, who kind of came up with it. And then the one who made it uh, famous, and his name is failing me now, he, he also did the geosphere type of architecture. Um, his name fails me right now. But there's been this wisdom that we're all on this planet, spaceship, earth, uh, we're all moving in the same direction. And it's usually those pioneers, those leaders like uh, Ellen MacArthur, like uh, Dr. Bertrand Picard, who kind of 
take themselves and put them on this uh, their own spaceship within the spaceship, realize you know there's a similarity to how we're all living on this planet Earth, and then come up with great foundations and, and ways to deal with it. So I I really appreciate you you talking about those those stories. The 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 truth is is we've got you here today because. We want to talk about Circulitics 2.0, which hints that there was a version prior, and what what that is for a wonderful tool. And I, I want to kind of get into it a, a little bit in a few moments, but that that's the journey we're going to be on because it's a tool that companies who now have realized that we're on this uh, spaceship Earth and we need to start living in closed loop systems and we need to create products and materials that stay in the organic cycle and in the technical cycles and really uh, don't come back to harm the planet. Um, this is almost a movement that has been kind of been around and been in, in the makings for a long time. And we're just seeing um, really the doubling down now after this pandemic or still kind of on the tail ends of the pandemic where companies are really saying we've heard the talk we've we've been discussing this for ages we never did anything or we kind of half-heartedly did something now my phone i'm sure your phone the emails are off the hooks uh saying how, how can we get into this new form of thinking and what tools are there available and I would say that that's your circulatics tool, but is there any other kind of things for businesses before they jump into a circulatics tool that they need to be thinking of or to even transition in their business models or in their organizational structures before they start using tools like this? How does that process kind of work? Yeah, I guess um, I'll get back to the tool or in circulatics question, but there is no kind of, you know, you don't need to do anything as an organization before you use it. Uh, it can also be a, a way to guide your thinking and inform you on what circular economy actually means for you as an organization uh, when you start measuring things. Um, but I, I thought what you said was interesting that, you know, it's, it's coming now and it's getting sort of big now, the circular economy. But as you said, you know, it's been around for a while. It's actually, it's been around forever. That's how nature works. There is no waste in nature. Everything is food to something else. And, and our economies or societies have, have worked very much like that in sync with nature until uh, we discovered um, things like coal and, coal, coal and, and oil uh, that allowed us to decouple from those natural systems and, and loops. And, and in that way, it's, it's nothing new. It's just we forgot how to, how to create economies and societies that are in sync with the planet. Um, and I think um, it's, it's sort of getting very timely now that it's, it's almost you know, the 11th hour to, to, to kind of go back to it and, and figure out how do we turn our linear oil-based economies back to, to being something that, that, that don't waste. And, and the sort of thing about circular economy that drew me into it and that this very sort of um, appealing for, for companies is that it doesn't need to be a trade-off between your bottom line and doing something good. Uh, circular economy is, as a concept and, and as us as foundation, are always trying to think and, and see how uh, it can be a positive financial way to, to, you know, it can have a positive financial impact for you as well. And, and that's why I think uh, um, many companies are uh, so serious about it and, and finding the benefits of, of using secondary materials rather than digging up new ones. And, and that can have economic benefits as well. And, and Circulatics is really to, there to, to help, for one, guide companies on what, what is it that you should be looking at when you look at circular economy. And it all starts by looking at your strategy and if, if, if circular economy is at all as an organization you know, on the table for you. And, and that's really where it all starts. And then we get into, you know, material flows and energy and water flows and so on through your company. But, but that's where it starts. And, and that's why it can be also, even if you've never heard of circular economy, using circulatics will kind of give you a nice overview of, of, of what it could be 
for your company in terms of your strategy, uh, your employees, your external engagement, setting up your operations and IT systems the right way to deal with this new way of, of doing business and then looking at really uh, what matters for most, which is material flows and how you're able to source circular materials and produce products that, that can be used and reused as many times as possible. Yeah, so some of the writings that I was mentioning before this uh, spaceship Earth thinking, so not only Kenneth Boulding, but then the gentleman I forgot was Buckminster Fuller or Bucky, who kind of did this spaceship Earth, this uh, geodomes and things like that for the built environment and moving us to think about materials and, and things in a different way. But as you so eloquently said, it's the beginnings of life. It's a we're, we've always been in a closed system, and uh, we we crawled out of the primordial soup, and and um, we we sometimes hear the this the sci-fi examples where you know is is the resilience of living in a closed system in outer space or on Mars where you have to every input and output has to remain in that system for thousands of years and could come back very quickly in a smaller system to to harm you as a human being so I, I, I like how you explain that and that that thinking and transition it's just another way of really seeing the world and how it functions but there's also uh, an aspect in there not just as business but as human beings where we've got to kind of reconnect ourselves <clears throat> with our earth and the ecosystems that we live in to kind of also have that shift on how we see life and how we see the way things work. Um, most of, uh, as we go into circulatics, most of those economies that we've been working with around the world are very extractive economies, this cradle to grave model. So we extract resources out of the earth and they get used once or a couple of times and then they're discarded and then they become pollution or waste uh, for us that come back to, to haunt us. And, and there are many, uh, models out there, there are a few models out there that are really thinking in, in this circular economy way. Um, Johan Rockstrom's planetary boundaries, the safe operating spaces of planetary boundaries, donut economics, uh, going even back further, uh, Herman Daly uh, and his ecological economics, just kind of connecting us back to the earth, the way the earth works and how we're on this planet of finite resources. But they have the opportunity to almost endlessly regenerate and restore themselves. But there's a balance of, of how much can be used and how, that, how long that time takes to go back in there uh, into the system so that we can use it again and it remains in that, that constant flow. Um, in Circulatics, the tool that you offer for companies and organizations that can help them with our stories in these transitions. Is that also a model, a tool that really can help organizations to sustain themselves for future generations, to apply the tools that they do get into that system, that they can regenerate their business and, and kind of have that net positive impact back on the planet, almost doing planetary services. Tell us a little bit more how that works and how that structure is set up. I think it's, you know, implicitly there um, in, the, in the form of circular economy itself. So circular economy is, is what the foundation thinks and, and what I think is, is, is the way to actually, you know, have a functioning economy and society that, that uh, you know, provides for future generations in a way. And what Circulitics does is, is to measure companies' performance in that today. Um, and, and, and that's, that's what it does. So as a company, you can create yourself a baseline and, and, and measure yourself once this year and, and then see um, next year how you've improved on, on what, you, what, what you've acted on to, to become a more circular company, I guess. And um, so that's, that's the link. And indeed, you, you said you know, net positive and, and, and these things. And I, um, how I see and how we see circular economies uh, is means to get to these positive ends. So what we're working on uh, a lot right now, actually, as a foundation is, is to connect the dots, so to speak, between circular economy and these positive outcomes in terms of climate change, 
how circular economy can help mitigate emissions or biodiversity where you know we're making connections between circular economy and circular sort of strategies business models and how those can have uh, positive impacts in in halting and, and reversing uh, biodiversity loss by tackling the uh, five uh, main drivers of, of biodiversity loss that that out of which I guess four are directly relevant to us and invasive species as the fifth driver is not necessarily that relevant to circular economy and business models but uh, pollution uh, climate change land use change um, uh, resources extraction all of these are really at the heart of, of what circular economy can deliver and so there is circulating that measures sort of um, performance in, in circular economy and then there is sort of this uh, knowledge base that that connects connects that circular economy to these positive outcomes as a, a sort of a separate step I guess one thing we are doing in circulitics this year though is 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 to link your circulitics results as a company or an, another organization it could be a public sector organization as well to the sustainable development goals so showing how, what the linkages are between circulatics indicators and sustainable development goal indicators that sit under the goals and, and how you have either a positive, neutral or negative kind of impact on, on those uh, sustainable development goals um, through what we can see in circulatics as your circular economy activity. So that's some, a, a very concrete thing that we hope to, to roll out in the next version towards the end of this year. That, that's beautiful. So <clears throat> do you see that something is, that also could help organizations with their reporting or um, yeah, how, I, how they can see where they're fitting in, not, not only in the circular economy, but also how they maybe can report on their sustainability efforts and things like that for the goals? Yeah, absolutely. And, and we see that. So circulitics for now is, is there is no mandatory disclosure. So it's just for you as an organization to know where you're at and how far you're going to uh, your end state that you want to be at <laughs> in terms of doing things more circular in a more circular way uh, but companies can and do choose to disclose their scores and, and I think that's what we also encourage you know to show what you're doing in circular economy and where you are today even if it's not great today uh, talking about it is is a great way to get attention to to um your sort of proactive actions to, to do better and and uh, I think just more broadly there is quite a quite a lot of energy to to consolidate a lot of these non-financial accounting methods and standards into as much as possible one like we have on financial side financial accounting is very similar across the planet and to do that for the non-financial Sort of parameters of, of company performance and that has a lot to do with environmental performance and and something we're doing also this year a lot is to um try and get circular economy into those sort of emerging attempts to create that standard uh, because we see that as really critical um in achieving those positive environmental ends that we 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 want in terms of mitigating climate change or tackling biodiversity loss or, or having a sort of net positive impact on the planet, et cetera. You can't really do that until uh, you've fixed uh, the economy and you've fixed the material flows, because that really, it, it's not separate issues. Climate change is not separate from the way we produce and use materials. It's very much connected, embodied energy and um, energy just used to, you know, transport goods and and, and all of that. So there's the energy solution, but there's also the material solution to climate change. And so all of these are connected. And that's why uh, we want to make sure that companies do in the future report on their circular economic performance to, to show how they're acting to, to um, have these positive impacts. There, there's two things you brought up and two almost two separate questions, but I want to uh, bring them out now so that we can make sure <clears throat> that we address both. The first one is what I'm strongly hearing from you from what I understand and know about the circular economy, which is, you know, the step before we get into the circulitics 
is that it's just not an add-on to business as usual. It's an entire new operating system, economy, economic model um, that we can use. Um, but going back to how we started our conversation of what all there's out there, you know, there's extractive economies, there's capitalism, there's um, the donut economics and on and on are are those models that work as a circular economy that have some kind of a integration of the circular economy? Are those circular economy specific types of models? Are they separate? Are they in alignment together? Do you work with planetary boundaries? Do you work with the donut ec economics with Kate Relworth and, and yeah. things like that? So I, I kind of want to understand that. And, and what I also hear it's, it's not like we've got to add circular economy onto our current extractive economic models and our current economic models that we've, we're seeing out there. We've got to actually recreate a new way of doing business, a new way of uh, our economic systems. So I want to touch on that. But just let me tease real first the next one. The other thing that you said about circulitics, and as we, I, I want you to go back before we go uh, any further and really explain what it is, how does it work? Because from what you're saying, what I hear is it's, it's, a, it's a system that's it's not really just about measuring and reporting, but it's one of actions in the beginning of what you can do, how you can change that model and, and what you can do. And so, yes, you get the measurements and you get the, the, the reporting possibilities with the SDGs that would come, but that you get a report on actions that have actually transitioned. And that's where the stories come from. And I kind of want to go deeper in that. But first, I want to jump back to, to the first question. OK, the first question first. So yeah, um, there are a lot of similarities. And, and Cradle to Cradle, for example, was a big kind of influencer to, to how the foundation, how the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has defined a circular economy. I guess cradle to cradle is more looking at uh, a product or materials journey through through the system where circular economy is more saying what the system itself should look like, what the economic system should look like. And Kate Kate Rower's um, uh, donut economics economics is also you know it's a, it's, it's very close to um, what we say. And then Kate was just in our uh, we have a weekly circular economy show, and she was just uh, there. Um, towards the end of last year. And uh, I think there are many synergies um, um, between those two sort of similar schools of thought, I guess. Um, the circular economy, how the foundation lays it out is, is talking a lot about the economic, economic benefit of having a better system for the planet. And that's really at the core of it. Whereas, and, and this is my view, you know, but in, in donut economics, it's, it's showing what are the kind of, what's the, operating space between creating um, uh, sort of, I, I might probably call it the wrong way, Kate will <laughs> not like me, but sort of quality of life uh, to a level where it's, it's you know, equal and acceptable and, and good for everybody, but not sort of jumping over the planetary boundaries that, that then um, is, is another um, important factor in this whole package so in a way they are looking at the same it. thing from different angles i guess you know yeah i i i just want to know and it sounds like you're you're describing that, that that you're working together there's a lot of synergies there's a lot of alignment but what tends to happen is we have you know five different economic models or five different systems and they're all wonderful but they're also kind of all going in their own direction no it's my thing it's it's this mm. thing and and, and they're all great, but, it, and that's, so that's what I want to know is, does the circular economy plug into a lot of these different things or is it, um, it's described differently. It's more of a framework that can be used with all these models. And yes, overarching, it is the circular economy, even though she calls it donut economics, it's pretty much the same thing. We just need to make that shift to the overarching thing. Uh, I, I, and, and it's confusing, and but it's also confusing to those who hear five different models out there that, you know, donut economics, planetary boundaries, circular economy, and that I, I want to see how can, 
are they all the same? Are they all working together? Are there finite differences? Or, or do we need to look at it in a different way of, of transitioning? And I, I'm, I don't want to put you on the spot. I just want to see if you maybe help us understand how that works and what that you're maybe we're not that far away. And, and that's why we're developing these tools so that eventually, you know, that's the end goal that we all unify yeah. in, a, in this unique model. Well, I, you know, I, my understanding of, of these different concepts is probably not deep enough to really properly answer, answer your question. But one, one thing that just came to mind when you talked about that is that uh, all of these models and, and schools of thought um, aim at becoming obsolete, right? Like we don't need, if the, if the economy wasn't wasteful, we wouldn't need to talk about it, right? So, so in a way, I think they all have the same end goal, which is that we shouldn't talk about these concepts at all anymore. <laughs> but, um, you know, like who's winning, who's losing, what's the most prevalent concept? It really, in a way, doesn't matter uh, as long as we make sure that we operate within planetary boundaries, we have positive impact on the nature, we create, you know, inclusive economic growth um, that's decoupled from resource use, all of these concepts that are shared. And, and then I think there's merit and reason why they are, you know, these kind of shared concepts are packaged differently because uh, they, you know, um, are for different, I guess, audiences and for different purposes somewhat. So um, there's a reason why they all exist. Um, and and it, I, I wouldn't see them as competing more, more than, you know, having been created for, for different purposes. Cradle to Cradle talks about the material journey, you know, uh, Donut Economics talks about the sort of boundaries, I guess, for the economy to operate in and, and all that. Um, I think what's what's important is really that um, high-level policymakers, I bring back again the EU example, having taken circular economy as uh, as an important sort of um, component to um, recover from COVID and 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 have this green deal and and all that, um, and the circular economy taxonomy is coming up soon in the EU where there will be a hundreds of pages of long list of, of the economic activities that fit the model. Um, and it doesn't matter if you call it really circular economy or not, it's helpful if we all talk about the same thing in the same way, so that's, that's good. But in the end, it just shows what are the economic activities that are compatible with the planet in a way. Um, and, and that's important. And then large companies either, you know, voluntarily or, or because of regulation, um, doing the same thing, that's important. So making sure that, for example, your plastic packaging uh, does not end up in oceans and it's, it's not harmful to the environment if it happens to leak, but it is designed to stay in the economy forever. First as a plastic bottle, many times, for example, then you know, chemically recycled, uh, for example, um, to, to something else or to another generation of plastic bottles it doesn't really matter but that the important thing is that we we do the right things no matter what we call them i guess <laughs> in that, short that yeah that it doesn't leave the system and become a harm on environment and human human that's health right. i i you said this in the beginning and i think that's the the unique summation is there's a lot of synergies but i think that it's about um we need these different organizations they're telling us are these different systems of economic thoughts that are all kind of moved in moving in the right direction in the same direction of, of circular economy closed system thinking one planet living planetary boundaries those those type of thought process and that they're all aligned and collaborating they're cooperating together you said it yourself that kate was just uh, uh talking together and you guys have not only wonderful synergies but a lot of wonderful cooperation and together with that same moving in the same direction i i think we have a lot of strength to change those bigger very multicultural economic models on a global system uh to really have a planet that works for everyone and so uh, I think you very, very nicely answered that. And, and uh, I hope I didn't put you in the spot. I think now it's a lot clearer for those who listened 
to understand uh, that um, we're definitely in this alignment, not fighting against each other or disagreeing with each other on which economic model. It's just, we need as many and options and tools as we can to make that shift from that cradle to grave or that, that extractive economy. Yeah. And, and, okay. and that, 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 I mean, go ahead and you can just ask that, some of that, that, that leads into the next. Yeah, I'll just add a little bit on that. I think uh, having said all that, it's still important that we do share a commonly accepted definition of things uh, as an example, what does circular economy mean? Uh, there is a misconception and that's a big risk that circular economy means more recycling. That we just recycle our way out of this problem and and that's not going to work and that's not what circular economy is about and that's why it's important that the shared understanding and definition actually happens despite all of the schools of thought being out there and that's something that we're also trying really hard to do and and just what is that definition then and, and um one key aspect is that it is upstream solutions it's not recycling our way out of the problem but it's circular economy is about designing products designing materials designing systems that those products and materials live in um, that eliminate waste before it happens that keeps materials and products in use and eventually then uh, and for some types of materials regenerates natural systems. So those are the three principles that we, we go on and on about <laughs> and we think are at the core of the definition of circular economy. And regenerating natural systems is really, really important. Oftentimes we talk about the technical material side when we talk about circular, circular economy and, and recycling those, and, but it's increasingly about regenerating natural systems as we substitute finite materials with renewable materials. Uh, to make sure that these natural systems that those materials come from are taken care of um, and, and improve through soil health, you know, um, uh, the met agricultural methods that, that can be considered positive, you know, it can be things like no tillage, cover crops, all these things as a package um, are called, you know, regenerative agriculture that leads to better ecosystem health. And that's really important. And that's also a part of circular economy because if we use those natural materials in a circular way and we disregard the system they come from, nature or agricultural systems, uh, it's not going to work either. So it's, in that sense, it is, it's, it's much more, and it's much more upstream than recycling. And it's important that we all agree on that in a way. So we talk about it the same, we talk about the same thing in the end. I, I love it. Yeah, and I, I'm glad you brought that up because there is a lot of myths or misunderstandings about, about that in general, and it's definitely not what it's about. Um, I, I, now I, I think we're, we're nicely prepared to, to, first of all, understand what exactly is circulatics and how does it work? And is it like what I, what, I, what I heard you describe already, that it's kind of a way in the beginning to start some actions, some really transitional, transformational movements that then, let's say at the end of the year, not only do you have the measurements, but then you can report positively about your successes, about what's been done to transition to that new that new way of operating in, in a circular system, closed system. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll get back to the sort of impact or value for companies, but what, what does it actually do? So circulatics um, is a way to measure circular economic performance on a company or non-company organization level. It consists of 38 indicators, if I remember right now, not all indicators are, are asked to all companies. Uh, if you're a service company, you don't need to worry about your manufacturing material flows, as an example, and therefore we don't ask that, but the maximum number of indicators is 38. Um, it's, an, it's a three-step process for a company where you sign up for an account, uh, then you log into your account and submit uh, your data through an online system, securely, 
uh, and we will not disclose that information to anybody. Uh, and then you get an assessment done uh, with Circlytics tool. And so that's a code that lives in a cloud server that um, generates uh, this circular economy performance score, Circlytics score, that breaks on, down into different elements that we call themes. There are 11 themes in Circlytics going from strategy and planning to uh, material flows, water flows, money flows if you're a bank or a financial institution. Um, so it depends a little bit what exactly gets shown. Um, so you get a scorecard with those scores in them, in it. And, and um, for companies that are in our network, so members of the foundation or, or large companies of uh, over 1 billion USD annual revenue, we set the bar there, uh, we'll also generate or make uh, an analyst in our team will make a, a commentary uh, on what we see that's going well, where do we see as the next things to do on your journey to becoming more circular company and overall sort of um, wh how, what we see uh, in your company as uh, uh, in, in terms of your circular economy performance. Uh, we've set that threshold purely because we have a small team and we can't, we just can't do it <laughs> for, for everybody. We have now over a thousand companies who've signed up. Um, but, but that's what it is. It's an assessment, quite a straightforward thing. You sign up, you submit data and get an assessment done. And then the value comes at the end uh, for many. It comes through the process also where you may kind of have these moments where you realize that you have overlooked something. Large company in our network called DS Smith uh, paper packaging uh, or cardboard packaging company mostly. Um, they do other things as well. Uh, one thing they said is that we didn't really look into how we communicate about circular economy internally, and we kind of missed something on the people aspect. And Circlytics helped us find that. So things like this can come through the journey as well of getting assessed. But at the end, the scorecard can be used in many ways: getting internal buy-in, having informed conversations with decision makers, or it can be used to communicate what you've already done and what you plan to do next in a, in a sort of independent assessment of of your performance by somebody else, in this case, EMF, Ellen MacArthur Foundation can be very powerful. And many other kind of stories that we have on, on the type of value that companies have found from, from this assessment. Do you, so I, I guess I misunderstood it just a little bit. Do you have stories where companies have taken that assessment and that says, boy, we were really, didn't know how we were performing in this area and we were able through that knowledge through that assessment to really fix those holes or those areas to improve how, how we do that and to uh, create another action or a model to, to improve that. Um, and and uh, I guess that that's one thing, it, whether you have a story or if companies are using like that. And then the, the follow-up to that is, is that one that you would want to do a, an assessment every year to see if that's improving over time, if it's getting better, if it's, uh, or, or are you saying, okay, no, this is our point. How, how does that work? How, what are you seeing on the thousand company plus companies yeah. that are using it? Um, so yeah, the, the story. So one, one story is indeed just finding a blind spot in, in your circular economy strategy. Um, another story is where, um, and this is also um, publicly available, but Solvay, a, a chemicals manufacturer in, based in Belgium, they, um, they use Circlytics to inform their internal um, circular economy related targets and, and indicators. So they have their own environmental sustainability related strategy um, where there is a circular economy component and Circlytics was just used to inform uh, what that looks like. That's another example of how it's being used. Uh, another example is where companies uh, have had informed conversations with their material suppliers using Circlytics and, and being able to talk about what type of options they have for procuring one type of material and, and you know, the rate of uh, secondary material within that and, and things like that. And, and actually asked their suppliers to do Circlytics themselves to 
to to to make sure that they know where they are at. Um, and in that sense, sort of starting to create a picture of your entire su supply chain, Circlytics can help with that as well, to make sure that your first tier and second tier suppliers have done it. You know how circular they are. You know how circular you are, and perhaps your customers as well as or if they are businesses. And and that can be very informative because in the end, uh, we talk a lot about systemic transition, and that's you know two big words put together. But in the end, it, it means that everybody needs to move at the same time. When you talk about circular material flows, you need all the players to, to move at the same time. And that's a systemic transition, right? Uh, in, in its simple form. And that's why it's important that you, know, you do that as an organization and circulators can help with that as well. So that's, that's another story. Um, and now I forgot the second part of your question. <laughs> uh, you're totally fine. I, I, I... I think you've pretty much addressed that that um, part of, you know, how uh, the circulatics work, and and I asked you the follow up questions: how, how are companies using that as positive results that they're seeing? You you touched on this systemic shift, and that's something that I really like to to touch on. So in 2018, pretty much all international organizations went to the went from this linear or siloed approach to solving our global grand challenges to really the systemic approach, a systems dynamic shift in the way we think and do and act uh, to solve our problems. Um, Circulatics obviously is helping in the systemic shift towards a circular economy. Can you go into more specifics of how you do that, how you work with organizations that maybe are very hierarchical, very linear in the past, now to say well, what systemic we're, we're not even doing that maybe a little bit more touching on that shift and and the roles that you've played in it and how circulatics plays that role i guess it's better answered sort of more broadly with with what the foundation does um circulatics helps uh, it's also quite early stages so we've been we launched it in january of 2000 and 20 of time, the perception of time has just completely gone weird with working from home, but it's really just one year and, and four months uh, in the past. And when we launched the first version and the second 2.0 was launched in October of last year. Um, so though there is not much kind of history with circulators, but the foundation has operated for 10 years. And um, there, one example is uh, our plastics work. So new plastics economy is, is, the, is the team and the, the uh, initiative uh, where they bring together companies from um, all along the supply chain for plastics packaging, from brands uh, that we all know and, and, and use to, to companies who, who um, uh, use you know, oil feedstock, hopefully soon, uh, uh, you know, secondary <laughs> feedstock or renewably grown, uh, uh, regeneratively grown uh, plant-based feedstock. But anyway, every and everybody in between, because the realization when we talk about circular economy with these companies very early on is like, hey, wait a minute, I need to get my supplier on board. Hey, wait a minute, I need to get their supplier on and and, and this is sort of systemic thinking happens very quickly when you start to talk about these things because materials, you know, they flow through a system and you need to change that entire system. And the plastics work we've done has, has brought all these players together to uh, figure things out in a pre-competitive environment. And that's our network of companies. That's the whole idea. In a pre-competitive environment, you can talk with your competitors, your suppliers, your customers about what does it mean for our industry to do uh, this shift. And um, we're now in a, in a, I think year six of, of our plastics initiative where we've uh, launched two years ago, this global commitment where we're finally at the stage where those brands and other organizations are, are putting commitments behind um, changing the way that they use uh, plastics packaging and set targets for 2025. And uh, we have four years left to that date. And, and we hope to see big systemic <laughs> shifts in plastics packaging by that date. I do too. I really hope that that's achieved because there are some, uh, some 
big uh, issues going on in our world specifically towards that, uh, although it's just one facet of the big picture of, of our systemic uh, problems um, that we're facing around the world. Yeah. So we, we initially talked uh, about, you know, the spaceship Earth concept and, and uh, that we're all on the, the same spaceship that there's, there's this new question, <clears throat> ties to globalization, ties to the spaceship, that do you believe that there's passengers on this spaceship Earth? And also, um, how do you feel about this, this thought that we're, humanity at least, is divided by borders and limitations in one species from another, um, by orders, divisions, laws, and, and, and things in regards to globalization, global citizenry, and this spaceship Earth. Do you think we all need these local? Because the circular economy is very, can be very local. Yeah. It's also this kind of a global model. What, what are your thoughts and how does that work? How do we understand that better? Uh, that's a very deep question, I guess. <laughs> Uh, we're all passengers, but we're also all managers of the ship, right? We all should have the responsibility to make sure that we keep the ship tidy <laughs> and functioning. Um, and uh, in that sense, I guess we all should consider ourselves as global citizens, uh, being responsible for the entire ship uh, collectively. And, and so there are demerits for having artificial borders in that sense, uh, and, and thinking, you know, not in my backyard, but rather in yours is not helpful. There are also merits and, and you know, I, I it, it's a, such a multifaceted question, but um, there is theory on, on, you know, having sizable administrative areas and, and that being helpful in, in making sure that those administrative areas have services for, for us passengers or <laughs> spaceship managers and and um, uh, the ability to uh, create equal opportunities and 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 have health care and school services and all kinds of societal aspects like that uh, are not optimally taken care of if those units are too large and I think in that sense it makes sense that we do have that and I think there's massive value also in sort of cultural identity. And I realize that national borders don't always match with that. But in that sense, there is, there's a lot going for having sort of human centric uh, lines <laughs> to divide our societies in some ways, but in other ways it's not helpful. And, and that's really about this environmental uh, stewardship, I guess, of, of uh, our collective planet, because it's everything is connected, right? And I think climate change, it has been um, help, well, shouldn't say helpful, but eye opening in a way where we can see that it, you know, it's connected, the air is connected and you can't sort of hide from it. And, and that's why we, we really need to all work cross borders on, on those topics. So in short, helpful for some, not for all. And I think we all need to be a bit global citizens and a bit, a bit our local citizens as well. Uh, I, yeah, I like the term "glocal," so kind of a, a nice mixture of That's both right. uh, global and local. Uh, um, you mentioned in the beginning as well that uh, a lot of circular economy thinking, um, uh, especially circulitics, and that can be very specific and very local, and can kind of drill down yeah. as how we fix that, especially in in agriculture business. Is is kind of very, very broad as well as well as agriculture is so where we're shipping supply chains, shipping things all over the world. Yeah. Business has always been the global citizen. I mean that that really, you know, doing business all over the world and shipping products and goods all over the world. Um, obviously, the pandemic has been a global citizen this whole time. It wasn't mm -hmm. restricted by nations and borders and, and species, air and water, as you so nicely mix. What, what did you specifically mean on this local, how we can have this yeah. local type of a thinking? How does that work? I think so when you have um, 
sort of more reuse of products, you'll have more repair of products and, and refurbishing and, and so on. And, and that most likely in a, in a future where we do more of that is going to be more distributed. If you have a mobile phone and if you need to change a component, you're not going to probably send it to, even if it was manufactured in the Far East, you wouldn't send it there from, let's say, Northern Europe, but it would fix it locally. And so um, a circular economy um, without sort of consciously even designing for more local economies, uh, it would probably be more distributed because it just makes more sense that way. And, and I think there is also the push to, to consciously make that choice. And we've seen how very efficient uh, global supply chains are also very fragile. And so, so there is the resilience point to external shocks to the system where having a degree of, of being, you know, one or two or more steps more distributed is also more resilient to shocks. And so there's a lot going for it um, and, and reducing maybe the efficiency, um, because it's not always positive in, in the longer term when, when you experience multiple shocks. So um, that's, that's the sort of some of the thoughts on, on how circular economy is more distributed and, and can help with, with some of the supply chain issues, right? Um, yeah. I, I used to, uh, it was probably, Eight, eight or more years ago, really, when I kind of, and I don't know if I did a service or did a, a disservice, when I would describe kind of uh, just a quick, simple way of circular economics and cradle to cradle, is I always saw it as kind of really this leasing model that uh, that that's not cradle to grave. It's a product that when the newer version comes, that it gets get back and it's not recycled. It's put back, and I get the latest, greatest, most efficient model, but those products aren't being thrown away. They're not creating harm or, or that yeah. on the planet. Uh, but it's also a model that uh, uh, in some respects, it's, it's um, and I'm, I'm from the food industry. So a lot of food industries will go in and extract resources and things in, in a certain area. And then like five, 10, 15 years later, they're like, oh, we've used everything we can here. We need to leave and go somewhere else and start that model. But when they leave that area, there's a lot of sludge or waste or sometimes even a super fun site left of pollution and, and things left there. And then just so that they can go start over. And we've seen that in many different industries. Um, but if that that leasing, I want to continue to own it. I want to continue yeah. to stay there and make sure that it's regenerative. I see it as this regenerative type of a model as as leasing. Maybe that's wrong. I don't know. Has, has there been a? Sh I, I think I heard a few people at Ella MacArthur and Circular Economy also kind of mention that in, in some respects. Am I wrong? Am I right? Is there ties to that? Has that shifted? Thinking shifted? No, I think you're right. I uh, just to sort of caveat that there is no silver bullet in terms of business model for these things. But one example that's probably overused already is the light bulb and how uh, Philips has, has started to sell in some places, you know, lux or light, not light bulbs or, or fixtures. And so what that does, what that leasing model does when you lease these fixtures is that you have an incentive now to make as durable products as possible because it's yours. As a manufacturer, you don't sell the product; you just sell the service that it creates. In this uh, instance, it's light, and so that's very helpful. And, and that's kind of nice anecdote to the benefits of a leasing model and having the responsibility for for what you make. In a way, it's a extended pro producer responsibility that has a built-in incentive. <laughs> you know, so um, I guess in the agriculture sense, it's uh, it's uh, it's probably more, more complex, I guess. Uh, there is no yeah. more land in many places. Just you know, uh, move on to the next plot because it just doesn't happen. And, and so, you know, the how carbon content has been depleted from agricultural land, I guess, is becoming an issue because it just you know like soon you won't be able to farm on it. And what do you do then? And and that realization hopefully doesn't come too late. And and moving to more regenerative practices. And 
I think in agriculture also it's the it's the question of efficiency versus sort of long term um, well resilience or or benefits to both humanity and the planet and um, there we've probably gone too far or we have gone too far right and and um, one I guess aspect to to this globalization and and how much we should regulate things is that there's a time and place for regulation because um, things tend to to go towards um, this highly efficient extractive systems if they are not regulated at least if they do today and and so there's role for that too um, it's a very it, in the transition system. it will be less profitable probably when you transition yeah. from one way of doing things to another you will have a time when it's less profitable and something needs to gap that uh, bridge that gap right and and i think agriculture especially where um in many instances it is you know the margins that you get from farming are so low that you just don't want to take the risk and something needs to to bridge that in order to make the transition well, what I mean, it's so complex and there are so many systems involved, but there's some examples. I mean, um, specifically when, if we were to go to, into agriculture, um, way, way farming and, and, and agriculture, you, you know, used to work really is that um, a lot of that food waste or after humans had ate it and the peelings and the, the rest of that, even the, the human waste, would somehow be turned back into fertilizer and reused on that land to a certain certain extent and then that cycle will be created now we're shipping food you know thousands millions yeah. of miles across the world and um uh and, and and that food waste is going into landfills and garbages and it's not being composted it's not returning to the soils to help with that soil health so then on that extractive with agriculture you know, I guess that's maybe a big part why chemicals and fertilizers and things, well, how can we get the, that back into the soil? Mm -hmm. It's really created a, a bad system. Yeah. We also see the other trends of carbon farmers and a lot of movements in that direction as well. But it's very, very, very complicated on, on, on how that works. This whole um, thing about land use and, and, and how we see this leasing option and how circular economy works do you think we're educating the consumer or the end user wrongly when we set up a system like that or do you think that's an actual better system to help us function better in in the circular economy um we yeah we have thought quite a lot about sort of how do we talk about circular economy to to the user or shouldn't say consumer because we should only be consuming food really everything else is used and <laughs> so we're users of everything anyway um and i think it would be there is merit to put some of that responsibility to all of us of course we need to sort of both with our wallets i guess but the problem is that there are not too many good solutions out there and and so that's why we we work as a foundation with large companies is to say that that's where the needle needs to shift. Like we need to have those better options for the consumer or user. Um, if you put in a way like blame the user for being in a system that doesn't work, um, there's limited capacity for us as, us as individuals to, to fix that with our purchasing power. But the purchasing power of large companies is, uh, is a completely different game, right? And, and that's where we think is, is it, you can the fastest to try to fix this system is with the organizations, policymakers, companies that that have the power, the purchasing power, and the decision making power to to shift things faster. I don't know if that answers your question at all. Yeah, no, it, it definitely does because there's always that thought. Okay, um, somehow the consumer has to have a buy-in to that bigger economic yeah. system or to the the new circular economy, and I I think that the companies, the producers, the manufacturers, it would be fabulous if they didn't put that onus or the responsibility of how, how to recycle or get that product back to them or keep it in the circular economy, leave it to the consumer that they would kind of take care of that before the consumer get it, gets it in a lease model or some kind of other model yeah. 
to keep it in there or to transition the consumer over to this new way of thinking. There, there's one other aspect that comes into there and then I'll go on to my final questions for you. And that is, where does natural capital, true cost, total environmental cost as percentage of EBITDA mm -hmm. in this system come in? Where does it come in, in in circular economy? How do we account for those finite resources in our planetary boundaries that we're actually doing as uh, as I, we mentioned or discussed in the beginning, be net positive, create, leave the planet better than we found it, but keep it in this, this nice, nice ecosystem where the value of products are ones that, that take that whole system into account. So uh, it's really about uh, where does true cost or total environmental yeah. cost as percentage of EBITDA yeah. or natural capital come into that system does it play play a role are we um i mean one yeah, I mean, example it, yeah. I, I eat mangoes or cashews from vietnam or thailand all the time but i buy them from a grocery store here in hamburg and it, right. you know for even though it's organic and fair trade or whatever it's still only one euro something it's you know there's no way that yeah, the yeah. True cost the transport think, the labor all that's included and yeah. so is that involved in the circular economy? Is that in, in the system as well as far as business goes? Yeah, I, so implicitly I, I would say yes. So I guess internalizing external costs is a, is a whole different debate. Doesn't need to be different, but I guess it is. But um, just talking about food, for example, um, so the journey of a, of a, of a food from in a, in a circular economy would probably be more local, would probably be more seasonal, would come from a place that's regeneratively farmed, um, where you know the food waste or production sort of non-edible parts of that production go back into the land uh, relatively locally. Um, and, uh, and, and then it's transported with a means of transport that uses renewable energy. Um, and so designing a system like that will have less externalities. So I guess it's a bit of an implicit thing in circular economy where if you design a system that is circular um, and you kind of play with the principles of circular economy and power that with renewable energy. Um, you, you kind of solve at least partially that externalities problem before that becomes a thing in a way where the idea is to eliminate waste before it becomes a reality by designing smarter products. So, so there's, there's that implicit link, I guess. Um, and then the debate becomes very different, I, I think, on externalities. No, I think you you answered that perfectly. And I, where I was leading you to is something that um, is probably the last, uh, second to last big question I have for you. And, and you tickled upon it just shortly um, that there is a way to be profitable or earn a profit off of uh, circular economics in, yeah. in your business model. I think that if you let's take food for example since we've been talking about it what if we produce food with non-finite resources renewable energies clean tech processes have the sustainable supply chain and this uh, and the sustainable logistics behind that um, not only are we driving our cost of goods down because we're using more efficient and better ways of energy we're also paying that true cost that natural capital and then we can sell products at a competitive rate in the market. Plus we're regenerating and healing our planet. I see it as a better operating system, a lot more sustainable yeah. long-term model. That's also a closed system. And really, I, I hate to say, you know, um, self-sufficient or off the grid type of a model, but it's a closed system within a closed system that really functions better. Yeah. And, and it's, it's one that's not on this model of eventually cradle to grave. You've got a limit to growth where you've exhausted not only your employees, but all your resources 
and then your your product's either dead or you just can't afford it anymore. And so that's the kind of thing that I wanted to hear. Is there stories or models coming out of Circulatics 2.0 that you're saying, yeah, they're definitely better uh, for business? Yeah, no, I, I think, yeah, so definitely so. But it's, as you say, it is, it is I think it's more difficult when we have uh, an incentive system that looks at only a part of what it means to be an organization company that produces stuff. And that's on just the financials of that company. That's how we measure the success of a company. And so it's a, it's a misplaced target in a way in the bigger picture. And so it's harder with that to, when you do this transition to a more circular way of doing business, uh, um, for specific instances to make money out of it in some cases. Overall, our research and many others research show that on continental level, so Europe, US, it's a multi-trillion dollar opportunity to change the entire economy to be more circular. But for an individual company, it can be a hard transition to do. And, because the, and that's partially because the incentives are skewed to making quarterly financial results and for example, having incentives to, to have extractive practices and, and use nuclear or not sorry, not nuclear, but oil, for example, in some places. And so that's where we come back to metrics and measurement. And it's and that that's why it's important to have um, measurement that does not only look at your financial performance, but looks at your planetary performance, let's call it that, environmental performance societal performance, of course, as well. And incentivize companies for getting that right. For now, it's really public perception. So if you don't do anything about those things, you have more and more consumers, us, who don't want to buy your products. But having a more forced mechanism behind it is, is something that is actually going to happen. Eventually, it will, hopefully sooner than later. And having measurements you know, indicators that are broadly accepted in measuring that performance is important. And that's where Circulitics comes in. And that's where a lot of um, sort of more broadly the environmental and social indicators of company performance come in. Um, and having a broader way of looking at company impact beyond your financial impact and incentivizing you as a company based on that broader view is, uh, is, is actually, it kind of thought, feels like a dry topic, but that's, I believe, very important and going to shift the needle. And that's, um, we are doing our best to, to, to have a part in that through Circulitics as well. Yeah, I, I see Circulitics and uh, circular economy much more than corporate social responsibility. I see it enveloping environmental social governance. I see it as a better, economic model and system that's more e ecological economics and uh, well thought through of how we can function on this spaceship Earth as team members, crew members on the on the ship, not just as passengers along for the ride. Um, I have four more questions left for you. Um, be, before I get into those, I, I just want to say, is there anything that you would like us to know about Circulitics 2.0? Any stories that we need to know that we haven't touched upon or covered so far that are absolutely vital for us to know? And, and why should, should organizations go and, to your website that I'll list in the show notes to take a further look at that? Um, I, I guess, the, in, in short, it's why not? It's free. It's easy to use. And you'll get a sense of, of where you are at with your circular economy performance. Even if you haven't never you know, thought about that, this can be a nice introduction to, to that and, and finding sort of the business benefits from, from doing things in a more circular way. If you're a company that has thought about it and, and, and you're more advanced, it's a way to have a reliable uh, external assessment of your performance and, and track your performance year on year if you wish to do so and communicate your results and achievements. And, and uh, in, in that sense, there's benefits for companies at different stages of their journey um, and it's free. And so why not? 
Yeah, I, I'm I'm definitely going to use it and refer everyone to uh, to take a look and and I advise a lot of clients on ESG and and how to transition and use different tools and I'm very excited about it. I'm glad you're spoken to me about it. We we've had some hard questions already and uh, I don't see smoke coming from your ears. You've done very well. You've answered them all correctly. The hardest question I have for you today, though, is the burning question, WTF. It's not the swear word, so don't mm -hmm. worry, even though maybe we have been saying that in the last 12 months. But it's, what's the futures? Where are we going? What From you or Ellen MacArthur Foundation, tell us, what, what the, what's the plan? What's the roadmap? Where, what do we have to look forward to? Um. Yeah, I, I think the burning question is, is um, uh, I, I think it's nice to summarize. Uh, there was some months ago a nice graphic that was going in, in different uh, media on, on these waves that are coming on humanity, COVID being the first relatively big one, then climate change, bigger one, biodiversity loss, then like a, a monster wave on top of that. And that I think is, those are the burning questions, are those crisis that are happening that affect us all and, and how we survive uh, from those and have a healthy thriving planet uh, after these crises have been solved as well and and um, the only way that, that I see and I think the foundation sees that happen is is to have for one a more circular economy right so so that we we don't uh, extract materials, until we run out of them and, and waste materials until we pollute the planet, but um, have an economy that, that is in sync with the nature. And, and in a way, it's either that or, or it's the end. There is, because it's a finite number of resources on this planet, we just have to play ball with that. Uh, there is no other option. The sooner we get there, the less damage we'll do. So that will be the future. It has to be the future, but it can happen much faster. Um, before it's too late, right? And it's easy to say, and that's been said for decades now, but in a way it is true. And I think the kind of pressure is is all the time more and more on, uh, on climate, on biodiversity. And, um, and, and if anything positive comes out of COVID, it hopefully has shown how humanity is connected and how we all, through our actions in wearing a mask, can have actually quite a big uh, impact locally and globally and, and it's the same sort of uh, analog for 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 these other questions as well in in uh preserving what we have on the planet and making things better thank you so much boy that was a great that was probably the best answer i've had for a long time so i really appreciate that if there was one message you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be? Your message, Ellen MacArthur's message, yeah. Circulitics 2.0 message. Tough one. I think, um, and this is maybe from a personal point of view, but uh, we all, of course, have the power to think, change things in our immediate you know, surroundings in our lives by making better choices. But many of us are also part of bigger organizations that collectively can shift the needle fast. And so in our professional lives, driving change in our organizations can be a very meaningful thing to do and a faster way to change the system. Uh, and the more of us do that within our organizations, the better, right? So I think sort of connecting our, us as our individual sort of personal life to, to what we do, uh, for many of us, nine to five, right? So, uh, and and having those same ways of thinking and values uh, in our professional lives as well can can have tremendous impact. And and that's how I see it. And I think how our foundation also sees it that we need to work with larger organizations. And we are all parts of those organizations. They they are just concepts. The people run them, us. And it's important that we use our power there to make things happen. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? 
Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> maybe it's a bit similar to what I said, the one mess. It's, it's like, the, I guess, you know, being, you know, proactive in trying to solve problems and um, create solutions, think of, of the solutions that you can have to, to make things better, can have uh, surprisingly large impact. Um, and, and I hope that, for example, Circulatics with me and, and the small team around the tool can actually have and, you know, in an unexpected ways we can have larger impact that we can, we can, we even know about and, and um, not being discouraged with, with being just an individual, I guess is something I, I could have told myself earlier on. What should businesses be thinking about if they uh, just right now from listening to our podcast, they go to the description, they click on one. Is there anything that they need to know? They can just jump in self-explanatory to use Circulatics 2.0. Any, any caveats or advice or things that you would suggest to them besides that it's free and it's, it's uh, still fairly new? Yeah, I, there's a tremendous amount of, of resources on our website. And actually, when you sign up, we'll link to those. So uh, if you've never heard of Circular Economy, signing up to Circulitics um, and using the resources that we link there to learn about it more uh, in online re on, through our online resources is, uh, is, makes it less daunting, I guess. So um, uh, go and explore. <laughs> Yarko, thank you very much for your time. It's been a sheer pleasure. Uh, I really enjoyed every moment. We could talk for hours, but we're out of time. And I really thank you for telling us about Circulatics 2.0. Thank you, Mark. It's, it's really been a very, very nice discussion and, and a great way to start, start uh, today. Yeah, it's been nice that you let us inside of your ideas, and I hope we can have a follow-up discussion very soon again about Evelyn MacArthur Foundation's circular economy and circulators. Thanks so much. Take care.